Hi, and welcome to this course. My name is Eirik, and I'll be one of your instructors in this course. So, first of all, what is NumPy? So NumPy is a Python library, and it's an abbreviation for numerical Python. So if you go to NumPy's homepage, they give the following description. They say that NumPy is the fundamental package for scientific computing with Python. In addition to this, it's also the default library for linear algebra and numerical computing in Python. Finally, it's also one of the core libraries of the Python data science stack. So it's really common to do data science in Python, and then you typically work with a bunch of different libraries, and NumPy is one of them. In fact, NumPy is so essential in this stack that the stack is sometimes called the NumPy stack. So this is what NumPy is. Next question is, why should you learn NumPy? And the first reason is that it's very compatible with other Python libraries. So it's used by a bunch of different libraries. Here I've just listed five of them. So this is matplotlib, which is used for plotting, pandas, which is used for data handling, and additionally we have three more libraries, namely TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and PyTorch, which are all machine learning libraries that heavily uses NumPy. Additionally, NumPy is relatively easy to use. It's not completely trivial to learn, otherwise you probably wouldn't need this course, but it's not a very difficult library to master. So Python is open source, meaning also that it's free to use. This is in stark contrast with MATLAB, Mathematica, and Maple, that are all programs that do similar things to NumPy that are not free, but require a subscription. NumPy is also what I would call mathematically mature. It implements a lot of different things like random number generators, a lot of linear algebra routines that we'll look at, Fourier transforms, and so much more. And we'll look at all of these things throughout the course. Finally, it's also very performant. So NumPy is really fast, as the core of NumPy is really well-optimized C code. So here we get the best of both worlds as we have fast code, but also a high-level syntax, very similar to the Python syntax you're probably used to. So here I am in a Jupyter Notebook. Stina will tell you all about Jupyter Notebooks soon. But instead of just telling you that NumPy is fast, I really wanted to just show it. You don't need to worry about the details here, I just really want to show you that NumPy is incredibly fast. So let's import NumPy as NP. So what I do here is to make a list of the first 10 million numbers, and then I multiply each element in the list by the number 3 by using what's called a list comprehension in Python. So when I run this cell, you can see now this took 2.8 seconds to run. This is with usual Python. Now let's do it in NumPy. So here I make what's called a vector with the first 10 million numbers, and then I multiply them by 3. So notice first of all that the syntax is actually a lot more simple here in NumPy than it is in Python. That's because NumPy is optimized for doing linear algebra. When I run this, you can see here that the running time is almost a tenth of the running time in Python. So NumPy is incredibly fast. Hi, and welcome. In this video, we are going to go through how to install Anaconda on your computer. So here I am at the Anaconda's webpage, which is anaconda.com. And I'm going now to navigate to the Anaconda installer. So first of all, I go to Products and Individual Edition. So here you see that you have the Download button. So let us press this one. And we scroll down all the way to the end of the page. So here you can choose your installer. For me, it's Windows 64, but you also have like Mac and Linux. So just choose the one that fits your computer and go through the entire installation. After you have installed Anaconda, you can go to Anaconda Navigator. So either you can search for Anaconda Navigator on your computer, or hopefully you will have a desktop icon named Anaconda Navigator. So here you can see several different programs. For instance, Jupyter Notebook, which is the one we are going to use, but you also have other programs like Spider and so on. So first of all, we go to Jupyter Notebooks and press Launch. So Jupyter Notebooks should be now opened in your web browser. So here you see your file directory. So this is on your computer. It's not on the web, even though it's opened in your web browser. So to create a new Jupyter Notebook, you go up here, press New, Python Free Notebook, and now it opens a new Jupyter Notebook for you. So here you see the title, which is Untitled 2. So let me replace the title, and let me call it My First Notebook. And go down here and press rename. 
In Jupyter Notebook, there are two kinds of cells. We have markdown cells and we have code cells. So a code cell always have this thing here on the left. To make this cell here, a markdown cell, we can go up here, down there and press markdown. So the difference between a markdown cell and a code cell is that a markdown cell is where you explain your code and write text or some mathematics, and a code cell is where your Python code comes. So this is now a markdown cell, since it doesn't have this in and then square brackets. So let's write some text. So now I have written some text here. And what I can do now is to run this cell. So now you can see that the text got formatted and we jump down to another code cell. So let me switch to another markdown cell and go through some markdown syntax. So first of all, we can make headers in our Jupyter Notebooks. We make headers with the octothorpe symbol or commonly known as the hashtag symbol. So here you have a header. And if you have one, it's a big header. If you have two, it's a bit smaller header. And if you have three, it's an even smaller header and so on. So let me also run this cell here. And now you see that you have a big header, a smaller header and an even smaller header. So let me double press here and you see that we go into our markdown again. And now I can edit as I want inside here. So let me write some mathematics. So you can write later code in your markdown cell. So let me write here is some math. And as you always do in LaTeX, we have two dollar signs. So inside the dollar signs now, I can write later code. So for instance, if I want cosine, I can write backslash cosine of x. And if I now run the cell, you see that I have cosine here. I can also write things like sums. Like this and compile. And now you see that we have the sum symbol here. So if I have two dollar signs at the beginning and the end, so if I now run this cell, I end up with a sum on a separate line. So let us now move to the code cells. So here we have a code cell, which you can see by this en and square brackets here. You can also see that up here, it's on code. So let's try with a small Python program. So let me make a list in Python, which is just going to be one, three, four, and 101. So here we have a list. And to run now, we do the exact same thing. We go up here and press run. So now you see that this thing here changed a bit and we have the number one here. So now this cell has been run. So if I'm now in a new code cell, write print and then my list, then I can access my list in the new cell here. So let me try to run this one. And now we see that we have the number two and then my list here, which is printed below. So let us now redefine my list by using slicing. So we write my list. And then I want to take the slice from the zero index to, but not including the third index. And the notation for this is semicolon, which means take everything before and then free. So now the endpoint here is not included. So let me run this cell. And you see the number three here again. And let me try to run this cell again here, the second cell. So after I run this cell, you see that now only the first three numbers are printed out and not the entire list. And the reason for this is the run order. So if you see the numbers here, we have one, which is the first cell we run. And then we run this one one time, which was the second time we run one cell. And this is the third cell we run. And this is the fourth one. So these numbers is kind of the run order of the program. 
So since we've run this cell before here, where we redefined my list, we end up with my list being something different than it was originally. So this might cause a bit of problems that the running order and the order which the code is, is not necessarily the same. So if we want to run the entire document and everything in order as it is written, what you can do is go into kernel and then press restart and run all. And this will restart the numbering and just run everything in order. So let's press here. And it will have a warning because you are overwriting a lot of things. But let us just press restart and run all cells. And now you see that everything is run up here as well. And we have the order again, one, two, and three. And we have the entire list here. So what you might have noticed is that I do not always go up here to run my cells. And the reason for this is that there are several shortcuts in Jupyter Notebook. To find a list of all the shortcuts, you can go to Help, and then Keyboard Shortcuts. And now you get all the shortcuts here. And there are several of them. So what I usually do is that when I want to run the cell, I press Shift-Enter to run the cell and make a cell below. And this is exactly the same as pressing run does. You also have similar sort of commands like control enter, which runs the selected cell and so on. So when you are really comfortable with Jupyter Notebook, you should try to learn some of these commands to make coding faster. For now, I will start only using shift enter when I want to run my cell. So let me go down here and close the keyboard shortcuts. Finally, I wanted to talk about the main theme of this course, which is NumPy. So let me just write a header here. So I have a markdown cell and let me write NumPy and then shift enter to run the cell. And what I want to do now is to import the NumPy package. So you do this with the import keyword, then NumPy. And usually when you import NumPy, you import it with the alias NP. So I will do this as well. So this means that instead of referring to the NumPy package as NumPy, which is a bit long, you can instead refer to the package just with NP. So let me import the package by running this cell. And now I can use NumPy. So the first thing I will do is to make a list and let the list consist of 1, 10, 100, and 1000. And let me run this cell again like this. And what I want to do now is to make my first NumPy array. So this is just to make sure that everything is working. So to make an array, we write NP for NumPy. Remember that we said that instead of writing NumPy, we can now write NP array. And what I want to do is to take my list and make it into a NumPy array. So I can write my second list and now run the code again. So that worked perfectly. So let me now print out the array like this. And now you see that you have an array. Eirik will go more into what a NumPy array actually is and how to create them. But for now, the important thing is that we don't get any errors. So what we can also do just to test a bit about my array is to take the array and multiply it by two. And then run the cell. And now you see that the output here is just all these numbers multiplied by two, and you have this array in front of it. So an important thing that we are going to use a lot in Jupyter Notebook is that whenever you are returning things, like here, it will take the last thing you returned and actually print it out below. So instead of writing a print statement, you can just write my array. As a final thing, we are going to go through how to get help. So often when you're doing programming, you have some function or something and you kind of do not remember what it does or are unsure of what it does. And then it's very important to manage to actually find the information you are looking for. So let me make a markdown cell here with the header help. 
to symbolize that we need to know how to find help. So let's say that we have the function np dot arrange, and we do not know what this function does. So Eric will go through this function, but for now we do not know what it does. So let me take in the number four and just see that it does something. And what it gives us out is the numpy array with the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3. So let's say that I want to know more about this function np.arrange. What I can do is to write help and then the name of the function, which is np.arrange, and run this cell. And here I get a lot of information about this specific function. So I get that it returns evenly spaced values within the, a given interval, and that it takes in a start and a stop and a step. So you have a lot of information here about the function. So I'm not going to go through all the information, but you also have some example of usage here. Another way to do this in Jupyter Notebook is to write np.arrange and then just a question mark instead of the entire health thing. So let me run the cell here. And now you see that the doc string or the information about the function comes up in a separate window here. And it's the same information from before. So this was the second way to do this. But my favorite way to do this is if I have a function is to just press shift plus tab. So now I have the doc string here with all the information about the function. So this is probably the quickest way to do it in Jupyter Notebook to just like, oh yeah, here is the start and the second argument is the stop and the third one is the type and so on. The final, final way to get help is to go into NumPy and find the documentation for NumPy. So here I am at the NumPy webpage, which is numpy.org. And I can go up here, press documentation, and here you have a lot of different tutorials. So in the documentation, you can find like the quick start tutorial and the setup and so on. And you have a lot of information available on NumPy's page. So this was everything I wanted to go through in this video. So see you again in the next video.